Mike Pond is a therapist with true empathy for his addicted clients. He knows how it feels. This is where I came down and uh, passed out that freezing night, curled up in here with my bottle. Everyone in Mike's life told him to go to AA, but Mike kept failing the program, and he's not alone. In fact, Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't work for most people. So, Mike, now it's your turn. Sober once more, Mike's on a mission to discover science-based addiction treatment. I really relate to these rats. <laughs> He's finding a revolution in addiction research. This is like the most exciting thing that's happening in healthcare. From understanding how impulsivity sets people up for addiction to mapping the reward circuitry in the brain. So that's you. Oh boy. A revolution that offers new hope and new treatments to those whose lives are wasted by addiction. They're on the wagon or falling off it. They're clean and sober or wasted again. The painful drama of addiction plays out in countless Canadian families. Many, including doctors, still see addiction as a moral challenge rather than a medical one. But that may be about to change. Mike Pond is a 62-year-old Vancouver psychotherapist with a thriving practice. When he's not working, Mike's living the West Coast life. That'll be a traditional size Rebinista to go. Playing every bit the part of a man who has made it twice. In his previous life, Mike also had a successful practice, which included contracts with the RCMP, school boards, and First Nations, plus a lakeside home in Penticton and a picture-perfect family. Well, when the boys were, were little, uh, my typical morning would be I'd get up, I'd come out on the deck with my, with my coffee. I could watch the boys out here playing. They'd be riding their bikes or their, you know, on their skateboards over here playing ball on the ball diamond. Try on the ball. Oh, another big hit. Yeah, got a lot of really, really fond memories, good memories here. He's built a life helping others, but he could not help himself. By the time he was 50, Mike had lost this house and everything else that mattered to alcoholism. It didn't help that Mike lived in the heart of Canada's wine country. A lot of our friends were in the industry and we were surrounded by vineyards and wineries and we did a lot of wine tasting. The beautiful beach town of Penticton was a perfect place to raise a family and perfect place to morph from social drinker to drunk. Well, this is Campbell Mountain, and uh, I used to ride from the bottom here three or four times a week, and I'd ride right to the top. Well, I'd have two water bottles. One had my Gatorade in it, and one had my Gatorade and vodka. So I'd drink my Gatorade for the, the hard climb up, and then my reward for the fast ride down was the Gatorade and vodka. I had stashes in the garage and behind the old drywall. I, even at the beach, I had a certain spot where I buried a bottle. I mean, just like, you know, it was like a dog or something burying his bone, you know. Everyone kept suggesting the one thing they'd heard helped drinkers, Alcoholics Anonymous. My doctor said go to AA, friends, family, and so I went to AA, and I just kept relapsing. And when withdrawal got too hard to take, Mike ended up at this ER, he estimates 15 times. I'd hear things like, Mr. Pond, don't you know we have real sick people here? By 2007, Mike's drinking had destroyed his family. He moved out. The Spanish villa stayed there for one month. Tiki Shores stayed there for a month. Shoreline, I was there a few weeks. His family gone, his practice crumbled. Uh, my office is those three windows up there. Well, I was on a long bender, about a week-long bender, and I'd been locked out of my offices, and I had nowhere to stay. So I uh, busted down the doors and passed out on the couch in my office. And when I came to in the morning, I had uh, four resignations on my desk. Everybody was done. Everybody. 
With no practice and no family, Mike boarded a Greyhound bus. If he were ever to sober up, it wouldn't happen in Penticton. The bus spit Mike out on the edge of Vancouver's notorious downtown east side. It was horrible. It was filthy and trying to find something to eat, trying to find some place to take a pee. One need now trumped them all, find booze. Severe alcoholics risk seizures if they do not get alcohol. Mike had already suffered too. And I really needed a drink, really bad. And I didn't have a penny. Well, there's uh, people outside in the restaurants down there, and uh, I just said, does anybody want to buy a laptop? Finally, a young guy uh, said, I'll give you 20 bucks for it. I went into some pub, and I uh, proceeded to drink four beer very fast. <laughs> and then I blacked out. In less than a decade, Mike went from successful therapist and family man to homeless skid road drunk. The only place left for drunks like him, an unlicensed recovery home. The only treatment, more Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was really frustrated. I said, is this it? Is this it for me? Is this all there is? Mike was doubly distressed with his failure because Alcoholics Anonymous seemed to work for everybody else. One of the most dramatic jobs in combating alcoholism is being done by the voluntary organization called Alcoholics Anonymous. They saw really severe alcoholics whose lives had been deeply damaged. And, you know, they concluded, you know, correctly, I think, that this was a group of, of people who were never going to become moderate drinkers again. They really needed to stop. Founded in 1935, AA quickly became the go-to and for the longest time, only treatment for alcoholism. Millions credit the program for their sobriety. You can find a meeting pretty well anywhere, anytime, and in a field where treatment can cost tens of thousands, it's free. If you have a drink problem, someone's gonna suggest AA and may badger you if you didn't go to AA or that AA didn't work for you. So that piles on an experience to having drinking, where in addition to having the problem to deal with, you have to deal with a lot of pressure and potentially a lot of shaming. And that's exactly what happened to Mike. You're not being humble enough, and you think you're smarter than this program. Making people feel bad about their drinking was never what the founders of AA intended, nor is it great therapy. I mean, there really isn't any other diagnosis where it would be okay to get in people's face and scream at them and shame them and make them feel terrible about themselves. I mean, we, we reserve that one for people with substance use disorders. Mike discovered an estimated 40% of addicts also suffer from a mental disorder. And then, shaming can become lethal. When I was in one of those recovery houses, a 23-year-old man hanged himself. He was one of those guys that was ridiculed, scapegoated, shamed all the time. He hanged himself. He committed suicide. That should not be happening. In fact, alcoholism is a key predictor of suicide. Months passed. Struggling so much in AA, Mike went to see a doctor, a medical addictions expert, whose main treatment was more AA. How many meetings was I going to? Did I have a sponsor? Did I have a home group? Was I working my steps? I mean, the 12-step program was never, never was a treatment, really. I mean, it's, it's a way of living. It's a, it's a program for sobriety. It's a fellowship. It's to require people to go to meetings and work the steps. I mean, I, I, I really don't think it was meant to be practiced that way. If you had an infection, and you were given an antibiotic and, and it didn't work, no doctor would say, well, just keep giving that antibiotic then until this guy gets it. Mike never got it until a 21-day bender landed him in intensive care. 
Every couple of days, guys from AA would show up at his bedside. You know, that's the part about the 12-step program that I think is incredible and amazing, is just that fellowship and what they're willing to do for you. After 28 days in hospital, something shifted in Mike. All I knew was that that one, one particular day when I looked in the mirror and I just said, you have to do it for you and you have to do it the way that's gonna work for you. And I had lots of rest and lots of good food and proper medication. And maybe that's what, you know, gave my brain, you know, enough time and care and nurturing to reset itself. On August 23rd, 2009, Mike quit drinking. And so began the long road back. After months of struggle, Mike returned to work at this hospital as a psychiatric nurse, a giant career step back 20 years. There, his young colleagues put him on the dating website, Plenty of Fish. And that's where he met Maureen, a longtime journalist and the director of this film. I liked your profile. You said in it that you were working with mentally ill kids and that you liked yoga. I thought, yeah, I'm gonna meet this guy for a drink. Only you didn't order a drink and you came on transit, which immediately got my spidey senses all a tingling. I just said, you know what, I'm just gonna tell her. And I wasn't very hopeful. I had a lot of rejections and I was hoping I wasn't gonna have another one. When you were telling me this story, I could hear my, my girlfriends in my head going, run, run for the hills, you crazy. Instead of running, Maureen helped Mike rebuild his life. And they still have that to-do list. We're going to get your driver's license back. We're going to get letters of support to rebuild your practice. We're going to build a website. We're going to rent office space. Wow, that's a hell of a list. I think you called that my uh, life plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Change of life plan. Good morning, ladies. Hi, Mike. How are you? Five years later, Mike has a thriving practice once again and a mountain of debt repaid. Well, I would have never been able to do it alone, right? If it hadn't have been for you coming into my life, I, who knows where this would have ended up. But there was one thing left undone. Knowing a good story when she sees one, Maureen insisted they write a book. That book captures Mike's fight for sobriety and questions why no other treatment was available. I remember the morning I came in and said, we need to question the dominance of AA. I remember how shocked I was. You know, it was like questioning the go-to treatment. Just how successful is AA? That's something even the world's addiction experts can't agree on. Starting with the Cochrane Collaborative, which is the gold standard. That study's old, it's being updated this year. Project Match, which is like, I think the largest study ever done. Poor design and no control group. AA's own membership surveys, so this is 2014. Uh, at the end of one year, 27% of its members claim sobriety. Research suggests AA works for about one-third after one year, leaving the majority, like Mike, looking for something else. If AA isn't the answer, neither, it appears, is your family doctor. A major American report suggests the lack of care given addicted patients might even be medical malpractice. Basically, they describe most physicians as being unqualified to diagnose or treat addiction, and I think that that's true. In fact, evidence-based treatment, meaning there's science behind it, is largely absent in addiction treatment. I would estimate that in Canada, of those struggling with severe alcohol addiction, I would estimate that far less than 10%, and I would hazard to guess about 1%, are actually being prescribed evidence-based treatments. Let's give a warm welcome. Mike's now a man on a mission to ensure those battling addiction get those evidence-based treatments. The amount of suffering we endure to get clean and sober is a failure of the healthcare system. The healthcare system is finally listening. Science has begun to deliver evidence-based treatment for addiction. This is like the most exciting thing that's happening in healthcare. It, it's, it's leaping past other areas of medicine. And it's translating into new understanding of the addicted brain. So that's you. <laughs> oh boy. 
Oh, that's Raj and I. Yeah. You're holding Roger up. Yeah, look, I'm holding, holding you up, up up there, Roger. Yeah, you had to do that several times over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hold me up. Some years more than others. Yeah. Mike's quest to better understand addiction begins in this jumble of old family photos, where he hopes to find the answer to a question that plagues alcoholics. Why me? Lance Corporal Wilford Pond. Trying to act sober. And Dad just got drunk that day, or? Oh, we've been drunk all week. Oh, okay. Drunk all week. <laughs> Addiction has cursed the ponds for generations. Both Mike's dad and grandfather were alcoholics. Michael was 12, his brother Roger just 11, when they made a batch of root beer that fermented. And we started drinking it. Well, we got drunk. Sure did. <laughs> that summer. And I don't think either one of us minded the, <laughs> the effects of that root beer. It's funny now, but it isn't. Scientists now believe addiction is about 60% inherited, 40% environmental. There's likely no one gene, but more likely genes that create character traits that increase risk. Traits like impulsivity. I know I'm really impulsive. Yes. I do things without. <laughs> yes. I agree so strongly, eh? <laughs> I'm not going to tell on myself, though, eh? <laughs> To understand why impulsivity puts people at risk, Mike traveled to Cambridge University in England to visit this population of specially bred rats. We actually took this one impulsive rat, we called him Zippy, and bred him to other impulsive rats and found that the trait uh, tracked over time through the generations. Dr. Bianca Jupp took Mike into her lab and showed him the impulsive rats in action. These rats are supposed to wait for a light to turn on before they poke their nose in a hole for a reward. But rats that are impulsive actually can't wait for that duration of time, even though they know that when they don't uh, wait for the light to be presented, they, they don't get a reward. They just can't stop themselves, essentially. I really relate to these rats. <laughs> Scans of the impulsive rat brains revealed they don't wait because they have fewer dopamine receptors. But what our research has actually showed that even before these animals have even seen any drug, they already have a reduction in the level of these particular receptors. The lower amount of dopamine receptors seen in these impulsive rats may leave them open to essentially self-medicate. So what happens to the impulsive rats after they take drugs? What we see is that these impulsive rats take more drugs and they're more likely to develop uh, characteristic, behavioural characteristics uh, typical of addiction. So they compulsively use and abuse drugs. Now this is exactly what we see in individuals with substance use disorder. So it's possible Michael and Roger were born with low numbers of dopamine receptors. It's highly likely that everyone in your family has a, a lower level of dopamine, dopamine receptors. receptors. So Mike, now it's your turn. Let's see whether or not you're like our impulsive rats. Oh, I think I might be. OK. OK. So let's try the first one. Press and hold on the space bar. A green dot will flash very quickly. Mm -hmm. When you see that, tap the square where the green dot was. Just respond to the green dot. Yep. I can hear her snickering over here. As you might guess, Mike scored high on his impulsivity tests. I know this sounds cliche, but it, it really feels like I'm in a dream because uh, throughout the day and yesterday, I was thinking where I was six years ago. You know, on the streets, and so for this to be happening is just 
we're really, uh, really grateful today. At Cambridge, Mike discovered a tantalizing clue to what causes his addiction, his low level of dopamine receptors. Those receptors are part of what's called our brain's reward circuitry. Advances in neuroscience point to reward circuitry run amok, not lack of willpower, as the cause of addiction. In California at Stanford University, Dr. Rob Malenka helped solve the puzzle of how illicit drugs and alcohol hijack that reward circuitry. After five months of sobriety, I was driving by this shop and I looked over and there was this neon sign going open, 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 and it was the liquor store. That afternoon, I drank. Yeah, I mean, again, that's classic. This cue, the, the neon sign, activated certain parts of your brain that communicated to your reward circuitry and just said, man, I want that spike of dopamine. I really need it. I want it. I want it. When we experience something pleasant, our brains are flooded with a neurotransmitter, dopamine. This happens in the reward circuitry and extends to the prefrontal cortex, that part of our brain responsible for decision making. Say you perform a task a hundred times on your computer. The computer doesn't change. But if the brain does something a hundred times, the brain itself changes. So the tens of thousands of times Mike slammed his dopamine receptors with booze actually altered his brain. And we call these processes synaptic plasticity, the plasticity of synaptic transmission. That's how the brain changes. To see if alcohol can still hijack Mike's reward circuitry, Mike and Maureen traveled to Charleston, to the Medical University of South Carolina. What we're gonna see, ideally, is what uh, your brain looks like when you are craving alcohol. This is called alcohol cue testing. Put that near, you should be able to see the screen behind you. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Here we go. Mike has shown a variety of images of alcoholic drinks, non-alcoholic drinks. He rates how strongly each image creates a craving. The signal in his brain is independent. He can't control that, essentially. The, the brain doesn't lie. <laughs> I felt OK. Just a little tweak, little twinge when I saw certain images, but nothing, you know, major. Next day, the results are in. So, Mike, I, I wanted to show you the, the data that we got from yesterday when you did the, uh, the alcohol cue test in the scanner. Mm. And so this was the group of 10 alcoholics who, who did the same thing that you did yesterday. So that's kind of the classic alcoholic brain right there, OK? Then the second group I'll show you here, this was just 10 controls, so people who didn't have alcoholism who did the same task. You see most of that uh, activation is not present in them. Then he reveals Mike's brain. Yesterday, Mike said he felt almost nothing when he looked at these pictures. It appears his brain feels differently. So that's you. <laughs> oh boy, that's remarkable. Look at that. And, and so we're, we're really seeing activation in, in all of those areas. These scans capture Mike's brain as it craves booze. <laughs> What a day. I wonder how you feel now, now that it's all done. I feel sadness, relief, just a whole bunch, whole bunch of feelings. What's the relief from? I just, it's like now I know. It's like, OK, now I know for sure. My brain is different. My brain isn't like the average person's brain when it comes to alcohol in particular. You know, there's been so much pain and hurt and you know, the damage that, that my problem has caused, my family, you know, the people that I love and care about, that makes me sad. When we come back, relief for those like Mike with different brains. Pre-4th of July dosage. Excellent. Medications that cut cravings for up to 30 days. 
medications that Mike himself may need. It's like I know that if I had a few drinks, this, this would all go away. For Mike, visiting his hometown of Penticton in the heat of the summer is bittersweet. My, my sons grew up here, right? Yeah. And uh, it's been really hard to come back here. Here, Mike experienced much shame as a drunk, where everyone thought if he just had enough willpower, he'd lick his problem. But after his alcohol cue testing, Mike knows it's just not that simple. I don't care how strong-willed you are. I think choice is a, is a very difficult concept when we talk about this. From neuroscience come new treatments to beat addiction. Researchers have developed drugs that blunt or block craving, including one called Vivitrol, a once-a-month injection. And in a sense, what you're doing is you're tying the hands of your future self. I know at this moment I sincerely want to stop drinking, but when Friday night rolls around, there'll be another guy running the show, and um, he's going to make a different decision. Seth. Pre-Fourth of July dosage. Excellent. Good plan. <laughs> Any drinking urges, craving since I saw you last? Nope. No? Okay. Vivitrol is a slow-release injectable, which blunts the effects of alcohol and prescription painkillers like oxycodone. 30-year-old Ben Kirkendall served four tours of duty in Iraq, where drinking was endemic. You know, this is, for me, has been the hardest thing. Going overseas to a foreign country, to a battlefield, was way easier. I do that any day. But uh, you want me to come home and be a vulnerable, stand-up, courageous guy, that's, that's really hard. It is. Ben tried to stay sober but relapsed. One time I drank, it had been months, months. I just started drinking and just didn't stop. And woke up, I woke up in jail. Dr. Andy Saxon is Ben's psychiatrist. Since you're bringing up the Vivitrol, um, how's that working for you? Well, I think it's working fine, because uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't have any cravings or anything, so it's going a lot better. And one of the reasons people drink is to get that buzz or euphoria. And so by blocking those receptors, you can blunt the higher euphoria and even sometimes blunt the craving. And then people don't want to drink anymore because the alcohol is not giving them the effect that they were seeking. Studies show Vivitrol has reduced heavy drinking and gets even better results helping people kick painkillers. Vivitrol is not yet approved in Canada. Its pill form, naltrexone, is, but doctors rarely prescribe it. The term we use in healthcare is the number needed to treat and to prevent a heart attack. Some of the medications that commonly get prescribed, you have to treat about 50 people to prevent one heart attack. For the treatments for alcohol addiction, the number needed to treat is about 10. Again, I would hazard to say much less than 10% of people with severe alcohol addiction are being prescribed these medications. You know, I saw a medical addiction specialist, addiction specialist, weekly for two years. Not once did he suggest, prescribe any medication that would help me with cravings, urges. Not once. I had three life-threatening seizures. And now there are other medications to treat all the jitters and edginess that sends people back to the bottle. The classic example that's emerging now is gabapentin, which originally was marketed as a pain medication, but because it has an effect on the reward pathway that's implicated in alcohol addiction, it has been explored in that context. One thing. Dr. Barbara Mason studies gabapentin and similar drugs to treat alcohol dependence. The really down and out, actually it was a rat infested recovery house that I was in. My anxiety was so severe. And, and I went for probably almost a month with literally no sleep. And I, I slipped into a very severe sleep deprivation psychosis. Could these medications have helped me? And they would have helped you very quickly. Like we see after one week on gabapentin, we see that uh, improvement in sleep. In Dr. Mason's study, 
those on the highest dose of gabapentin were four times as likely to abstain from alcohol. And it even helped those who couldn't abstain. There were many people who showed a benefit and their drinking decreased, but they may have had a heavy drinking day here or there. So, so no matter how you look at it, right. there was significant improvement. Right. You could see significant positive change. Yes. For 80 years, the only measure of success was AA's standard, total abstinence. That Dr. Mason considered even a reduction in drinking a success is a radical shift in thinking about addiction. A shift supported by Dr. Bill Miller, one of the world's leading authorities on addiction. I did one study um, combining huge data sets uh, just to see what are the outcomes of alcoholism treatment in America. And about one in four people stayed abstinent for a year after treatment. So that's 25%. So let's take them out of the picture and look at the other 75% who have drunk during the year. Their alcohol consumption is down by 87%. Now for any other chronic condition, a 25% complete remission and an 87% reduction in symptoms for everybody else would be astonishingly successful. Mm -hmm. And yet we really disadvantage ourselves by saying you're a failure if you have even a single recurrence of what was the reason why you were admitted in the first place? To this point, this search for evidence-based treatment was to help other people. Mike could not imagine a day when he'd need it himself. I had a wee accident on the Harley today. Mike got stitched up in the ER, the damage limited to his face, or so he thought. I came home from grocery shopping and I opened the fridge because I normally have a glass of wine while I cook. The wine bottle was like totally empty and I thought, what the hell? Weird disconnect, maybe I drank that? And then I looked at Mike and I thought, could he have drank that? And I asked him and he said, no. And a few minutes later he said, honey, come sit on the couch beside me. I did drink that. I opened the fridge and I saw the bottle of wine and I pulled it out and I drank it. Then, of course, I needed more. And I scoured around that kitchen and I found a half bottle of rum. And I drank all that too. After having experienced so much shame in past ER visits as a drunk, all that humiliation came flooding back. And so did the cravings. Just that constant, restless, edgy, edginess. And, in, and it's a craving, you know. Not so much a craving, but it, it's like I know that if I had a few drinks, this, this would all go away. And do you want to go get a drink? No, I don't want to go get a drink. I want to have the effect of the drink. <laughs> In that moment, everything that Maureen and Mike had built together threatened to come apart. Oh my God, I can't believe this has happened after almost five and a half years. This is gonna give me a dose of humility because I've been a bit smug about your progress. And now I'm really going to truly find out what it has felt to walk in your family's shoes. What it was like was devastating. It was like a spiral or a tornado. It was like maybe it started off a little blips at the beginning. As time went on, years went on, uh, you know, the incidents became closer. So the storm started gathering. Your drinking took over everything. It just sucked every aspect of our life in. Like, the boys, the relationships, the finances, the house, the business, just everything got sucked into the problem. Many, many humiliating trips to emergency. Seeing the eyes of the doctors and nurses there in shame. They would just give you out of van and discharge you. And it's like, well, what am I gonna do with them at home? Like, how do you deal with somebody detoxing? 
I was so desperate because it's like, where do you go for help? Even after Rhonda found a new partner, she still cared for Mike. When can I let go of you? When can I let go of trying to help you? Even though our marriage may have been over, you were still someone that I loved and cared about. You were the father of my children. I care. I didn't want you to die. I had a hard time with that. You actually did me the favor of getting on the bus. I have to admit, I am scared and a bit shaken by Mike drinking. But I'm also pretty determined this is not going to be a repeat of the past. Because of our filming, I know there are more options now. Like that Vivitrol shot, the 30-day injectable. It's the first thing we should try. Just 20 miles south of the border, in Bellingham, Washington, Dr. Greg Sharp has a thriving addiction medicine practice. When somebody gets ready to deal with their addiction, whether it's alcohol or heroin or meth, um, that's the pivotal moment that if we don't throw everything we have at them, I think we're really being, being um, it's malpractice in my opinion. The shot costs $1,200. Vivitrol helps people reduce heavy drinking and in some cases maintain sobriety. Would it work for Mike? We really need to re-examine what does sober mean? Mm -hmm. They're working or going to school. What are we after? That's what we're after, right? Social and environmental or emotional progress. That's the measure. We have to shift our model to what does science say? It is just one day. It doesn't change who you are or your approach to all of this stuff. You probably even have more empathy for your clients now. Get a little too uppity. Maureen sounding supportive now, but can she keep it up? It's pretty early, but I wonder if he's in a bar. And if he's in a bar, what will I do about that? Take this time for yourself. Let go of any stress in your body. And as you exhale, let your thoughts float away. When he first got sober six years ago, Mike felt intensive yoga and meditation kept cravings at bay, and he was right. Research confirms meditation helps alcoholics disconnect from cravings and judgmental thoughts, resulting in fewer relapses. Now silently thank yourself for being here and for your commitment to yourself. Even with her new understanding of addiction, Maureen is anxious about Mike's relapse. She's learning a new therapy that helps families stop the cycle of shame and blame and learn to talk honestly again. I feel like now I worry that you are going to drink somewhere, but if I went and told you that, I think you'd be mad at me. Like, you get to feel really mad and upset. You get to feel that way. This is craft, community reinforcement and family training. And, and the other issue in terms of uh, positive support for positive behavior is, you again, you still have to take care of yourself. Um, and that to me is where the couple part of this is so important that you're aware of what you need. Mm -hmm. And you can still have a discussion, like it's important for my self-care that we're able to talk about one of what I would like to have happen in this relationship, which is I want a sober partner. My brain is still, you know, back in the old days where you're a piece of shit because you did this again. The I need to be punished part of this will make him go underground, um, which will then make you mad, which will then make you want to punish him. Um, often <laughs> that's a cycle that happens. Um, so, like, don't fall for it. Yeah. But uh, I think I got a one o'clock. Yeah, I got a one o'clock. In families that learn craft, Seven out of 10 treatment-resistant addicts end up getting help. But more importantly, families learn to lead less chaotic lives. Bye -bye. You know, we didn't wait for me to hit rock bottom. I got treatment right away, and I feel great. Mike believes the most important intervention for him was Vivitrol. At the Medical University of South Carolina, Researchers isolate a genetic variant that allows some people to respond better than others to Vivitrol. It's estimated only 25% of Caucasians have this variant. So I fully expected when we uh, 
uh, offered to do the test that you wouldn't have it, but in fact you do. I do. You do. You have the ASP40 allele and may respond uh, differently to naltrexone. These brain scans support the research that suggests Vivitrol and its pill form, naltrexone, diminish cravings. Mike urges his clients to ask their doctors for medications. Good to see you, buddy. See you too. The doctors say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to prescribe that. I've never done that before. To persuade doctors to prescribe new meds, Mike's got some high-powered help from the world-renowned Betty Ford Center. It's my pleasure. Let's sit down and have a talk. All right. We're now armed with an immense amount uh, of evidence-based treatment, both psychosocial and pharmacologic. Betty Ford now prescribes drugs to deal with cravings, and no one gets kicked out of treatment for relapsing anymore. Dr. Eichelberg works with a foundation to train doctors in addiction medicine. Our mission statement is to prevent the harm being done to patients by physicians who lack the knowledge, training, and skill to recognize and treat addiction. Rather than seeing relapse to drugs. In Canada, British Columbia will soon make this online course available to the province's doctors. In British Columbia, we have now uh, the largest addiction medicine training program in North America. Uh, 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 it's just getting started, so, so for that to bear fruit is going to take time. We've got a whole array of good approaches to try, uh, and, and we can tap into people's own wisdom about, what do you think, you know? This, and we can try this first, and if this is not the right approach for you, we'll try something else and I'll stay with you until we find what works for you. Mm -hmm. That's so much healthier than I know the one way and you do it that way or you're not gonna make it. Six years ago, Mike could not have imagined a relapse, never mind letting it play out in public. I just feel that it's something I have to do. It's gonna help. I think it's gonna help others. It's really helped me to step through this, this shaming and to step through all of the self-recrimination and uh, the guilt and uh, feeling like a failure. You want to model anyway. Yeah, yeah, I want to model that you can get through this. You can get through the cravings. There's things that can help you with the cravings. You can get through a relapse. I don't even want to use the term anymore. And I think that if we would have known, my family and I would have known what I know now 10 years ago, I still might be living in that house. I wouldn't like that. <laughs> <laughs>